it looks like we have a nice group gathered. We can go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Art Collins, a vice chair of the Hingham Land Conservation Trust Board of Trustees. Um, just wanted to welcome you all. And, uh, and I know we may have a few participants that aren't um, normally members of the Hingham Land Conservation Trust through um, an announcement that went out to the, through the Norwell Historical Society and and some I think some other people that are just um, neighbors of the Jacobs Meadow area and had an interest in it. So thank you for joining us if you're among those groups. So the first thing we're going to do tonight is we have to uh, we just have a little bit of business to take care of uh, um, an election, an annual election for our board members, um, and then we have our. Chair Eileen McIntyre, who many of you know and are probably the reason that you tuned in tonight. Um, she's, in addition to being on the Hingham Land Conservation Trust, she's involved in the Hingham Historical Society and has become quite an accomplished um, uh, historian, I think, in recent years. And she's got a wonderful presentation on a celebration of Jacob's Meadow. We've got another board member, Zach Mertz, um, who's who's uh, put together a really wonderful video, which is our uh, virtual walk, our first ever. Um, it's gonna be a, a, a spring walk at Jacob's Meadow, and I think that's gonna be great. And then we'll have um, some time for questions at the end. And just to note that the uh, program is being recorded for a future airing by Har Harbor Media, and it'll be posted on our website and Facebook and things like that after the program. So this slide um, shows the board of directors slate and, um, and every one of us serves on a volunteer basis. Um, and so what we're gonna do is have a poll that will come up for you to, um, to vote on the, the slate as a whole. So yes or no. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is we have one of our members, Martha Falvey is, um, been with us for 10 years. So I just want to recognize the years of dedication uh, that she's put into the organization to help make it what it is. So thank you, Martha. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll now and you should be able to respond to it. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. doing pretty well. I'll leave it open for another 30 seconds or so, but I'm happy to, to report so far it's a unanimous um, vote of confidence for the, the board slate. Okay, so um, without further further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Eileen McIntyre for that um, celebration of Jacob's Meadow, looking back at the rich history of this parkland um, that Helen Burns, who gifted the property and be, that became Jacob's Meadow, there'll be a lot of information about her, and then the Hingham family who, uh, from whom it gets its name. I'll stop sharing. Hey, hi. Uh, let me just get my screen share going. So good evening. My name is Art said is Eileen McIntyre and as chair of the Hingham Land Conservation Trust, it really gives me great pleasure to welcome you all 
to this 30th anniversary celebration of Jacob's Meadow. And I will add to Art's welcome to all of you who have joined us who are less familiar with the Land Trust. And if you'd like to learn more, you can go to hinghamlandtrust.org, our website, or see us on Facebook. But thank you for joining us tonight. So on a May afternoon in 1991, 30 years ago, the Hingham Land Conservation Trust opened a new conservation area and parkland, Jacob's Meadow in South Hingham. This evening, in May of 2021, we gather to honor once again the memory of Helen Burns, whose generosity created this conservation parkland. And I believe Helen's niece, Paige Dickey, has joined us this evening from her home in Connecticut. And if you're with us, Paige, welcome. Uh, we're also gonna learn a bit about the history of this special place and the Jacobs family who left their mark in Hingham and in Norwell. We also celebrate this 30th anniversary of Jacobs Meadow as Art mentioned with the premiere this evening of a walk at Jacobs Meadow, a lovely spring walk and our first virtual walk experience, uh, our response to the current pandemic conditions, but something that might be worth doing again in the future for some of our other properties. In 1991, in anticipation of the opening of Jacobs Meadow that spring, journalist Elizabeth Farquhar wrote a piece for the Boston Globe entitled, For Love of the Land, which said in part, behind the antique, behind the antique, uh, I'm sorry, someone just told me they couldn't see my picture. That's fine. Uh, uh, behind the antique Cape Cod Cottage on Main Street in Hingham, where Helen Burns has lived for more than 50 years, the land buckles and bumps until it meets the Fulling Mill River. She continued, like most of New England's tillable land, these fields and pastures of 100 years ago have reverted to pine woods and meadows. But thanks to Helen Burns, the farmland in this part of Old Hingham will be spared the next step, the next step, subdivision and development. Helen Burns, a founding trustee of the Hingham Land Conservation Trust in 1972, had moved into an antique Cape Cod cottage on Main Street in 1939. Over the decades that followed, Helen purchased about 38 acres of back land in Glad Tidings Plain and presented them as gifts to the Hingham Land Conservation Trust and the Hingham Conservation Commission. In combination with existing conservation land, this created an area of 50 acres of conservation and parkland in Glad Tidings Plain. Additional donors of smaller parcels that would enable the land trust to make the meadow accessible to the public were Richard and Virginia Kurtzman, the Goodlatte family, and Robert and Carolyn Garvey. Helen Burns said in a 1991 interview, I've been very fond of this land that originally belonged to this house. I'd like to see it kept wild. Well, tonight we are going to take a wide lens look at the land Helen acquired and how this land connects with the historic home she had lived in, as well as to the surrounding area of Glad Tidings Plain. As an important part of the story, we will hear about generations of the Jacobs family that descended from English immigrants, originally named Jacob without the S, who settled in Hingham in 1633. We will start though by recognizing the importance of water to how this land has been valued over time. Prior to the English settlers, land in what we know as Glad Tidings Plain likely would have been used by native tribes, perhaps seasonally, for planting and fishing due to the abundant water flowing through it. This excerpt from a map of the Weir River watershed shows that the area includes the Crooked Meadow River, here, uh, Accord Brook over here, and multiple streams feeding the Weir River, streams that prior to the arrival of the English settlers were not yet dammed for mill ponds. Well, here is an excerpt from the Hingham Land Trust Parklands for the Public map, which some of you are familiar with, showing the area today. The Land Trust Jacobs Meadow parcels are marked with the acorns 
along with and along with the adjacent conservation land of the Hingham Conservation Commission, which is HCC on the map, and the Laner Conservation Area, the most recent uh, acquisition by the town of Hing Hingham, together now provides more than 100 acres of protected open space in South Hingham. The wetlands here are today very important to the health of the Weir River watershed on which we depend as the source of our municipal water for Hingham, for Hull, and for part of Cohasset. And as we talk about the Jacobs family, the value of the water flowing through this part of Hingham will also be a key part of the story. Now let's get some insight regarding Helen Burns' wish to conserve the land that she said originally belonged to the house that she owned at 682 Main Street. I wondered what Helen meant by when she said that. So let's first consider the history of the house known as the Crocker Wilder House, which was built in 1801. There are two links from the house to the Jacob family. First of all, Crocker Wilder purchased the land to build this home from the estate of Lieutenant Elisha Cushing, who had died in 1734. Well, through his mother's line, Elisha Cushing was a great grandson of the immigrant Nicholas Jacob. In addition, Crocker Wilder's wife was Deborah Jacob, another direct descendant of Nicholas Jacob. So those are already two ties from the house itself to the Jacob family. Well, and if you review the history of the back lands that Helen had acquired behind her home, and that's what's on the screen now, there are more Jacobs family connections. So I took a look at the deed documents from the three adjacent parcels that Helen had given to the land trust. Two of these deeds have this reference to an 1887 plan of land of heirs of Joshua Jacob, hang on. So this was a survey done for these heirs of Joshua Jacob. And here is that survey. I know you can't see this clearly, but I have it up on the slide to talk about what I found interesting. This 1887 survey document, in addition to delineating the boundaries of this land owned by the heirs of Joshua Jacob, also shows the identities of the adjacent property owners at that time in 1887. And as I then discovered, the adjacent parcel owners each have connections with descendants of the 1630s immigrant Nicholas Jacob. So as I talk you through this, you will notice that the family has been known as both Jacob and Jacob. And in the genealogy research I've done as part of this presentation preparation, uh, it appears that the addition of the S became permanent with the sixth generation of the family here. So who owned the land parcels adjacent to Joshua Jacobs? Well, there was Seth Hersey, whose daughter, Lydia Dyer Hersey, was the second wife of Joshua Jacobs Sr., who had owned this land in the middle. There's Josiah Lane, whose mother-in-law was Mary Jacobs Wilder. There is Charles Robert Cook, a descendant of Elizabeth Jacob Cushing. Another parcel is owned by the heirs of J.S. Beale. Well, these are the descendants of John Beale, whose second wife, Mary, was the widow of Nicholas Jacob, who had headed that family of 1633 immigrants to Hingham. And finally, there's Samuel L. Fearon. He's over here. Um, and he's a direct descendant of Deborah Jacob Fearon. So, uh, so there's reason to believe that a lot of this land had, had ownership by Jacobs at one point in time. And I should point out, I've looked at some probate documents from some of the Jacobs family, and it was not uncommon for them to leave land, even in the 1700 period, uh, to their daughters, as well as their sons. Uh, so some of these uh, are uh, people who have descended through a female member of the Jacobs family uh, who may have owned some of this land. So let's now look specifically at the heirs of Joshua Jacob, for whom that 1887 survey would have been done. Well, Joshua Jacob Sr., who had owned that land, died in 1879. Joshua was a blacksmith. He had lived at 648 Main Street, a home that was built by his great-grandfather, Peter Jacob. 
He likely had inherited some meadow and pasture land from his father, Jotham, who had quite extensive land holdings when he died in 1852. And along with many of the members of this family, Joshua Jacobs Sr. is buried at High Street Cemetery. And here you see his headstone as well as his wife, Lydia. Well, the year after Joshua Sr.'s death, the census for 1880, which is not what is on the screen right now, so don't get confused by that, but the census for 1880 showed that Joshua Jacobs Jr. is living in Boston at that point with his wife, Mary, and a school-aged son, Harry. Joshua, interestingly, was then working as a musician. Well, then in 1900, and that's what is on the screen right now, although I don't expect you to read it, uh, but this is the bottom of one census page and the top of the next that shows this Jacobs family in Boston. Uh, so here in 1900, Joshua Jacobs Jr. is now 57 and he works making piano parts. He and his wife, Mary, live with their adult, now adult son, Harry, as well as Harry's wife and three children in Boston. And Harry is a clerk working for one of the railroad companies. So they've moved beyond the agricultural days in South Hingham. Well, I suspect that that 1887 survey to the heirs of Joshua Jacobs might have reflected a decision at that time by this branch of the Jacobs family to sell the land that they still owned in Hingham. This would have been a time when the country was recovering after a long economic depression in the 1870s, so they might have thought of this as a good time to sell. Well, it's interesting to note, though, that even though they had moved into Boston and, and uh, you know, their lives continued there outside of the agricultural field, they did come back to South Hingham when they uh, chose where they wanted to be buried. And here you see uh, the headstone for Joshua Jacobs Jr. and his family. And, and you also see that they were a generation that had added the S to the name. And they're buried, if you take a walk in uh, the High Street Cemetery, they're right next to the headstones that I showed you before of Joshua and his wife, Lydia. So here we trace the nine generations from the immigrant Nicholas, who was the 1633 immigrant who came with his wife and two children, down to Harry, who we were just talking about. So this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think eight generations. One of the things to, to mention here is that there are three generations of blacksmiths. There were also farmers, but John Jacob, Jotham, and Joshua were all blacksmiths. And we'll find an interesting way later on that this skill set seems to get passed on in the family. Here you see an annotated map of the Glad Tidings Historic District in December of 1974. I don't expect you to be able to read the details on this, I'm just gonna point out a few things about those numbered items. So number one shows the location of what was Helen Burns' home, the Crocker Wilder House at 682 Main Street. And she was just three properties away from Wilder Hall. I mentioned Wilder Hall because as many of you know, access to Jacob's Meadow today is provided by way of a gated entry behind Wilder Hall. And the parkland then continues behind what was Helen's home and behind some of these other homes um, along, this, along Main Street. The number two on the map, just across the street from what was Helen's home is the historic second parish church, which will come up again in our story. And number three, just behind the church and one property over is access to about an acre of conservation land along the Crooked Meadow River. And on this 1974 map of the historic district, the parcel is labeled as being owned by Helen Burns. She owned that parcel, including the home in front of it, which she rented out at the time. Helen later donated this land along the river, again, the back land, and in this case, characterized by huge boulders and ledges uh, to the Hingham Conservation Commission, which is part of uh, the town of Hingham. And finally, number four, was the home of Joseph Jacobs Jr., another descendant of Nicholas Jacobs. That home was built in 1868, and Joseph's property stretched back to Glad Tidings Rock, 
which some of you know is a feature of the parkland of which Jacobs Meadow is a part. And we will hear more shortly about Joseph Jacobs Jr. and his father. Well, this is a slide that some of you who live in the neighborhood may want to take a screenshot of. So go ahead and do that if you'd like to. What it is is a list of several homes that were once owned by Jacobs family members that still stand today. And based on their history, these private homes are all included in Ingham's comprehensive inventory of historic assets. Some of these homes stayed in the Jacobs family for generations. And a stunning example of that is the home at 627 Main Street, built by the blacksmith, John Jacob in 1787, the year that he married Tamar Cushing, one of many marriages between the Jacobs family and the Cushing family through the generation. Uh, that home remained in the family for 140 years until the death of Martha Fearing Jacob in 1927. As noted on this slide, these homes typify some of the 18th and 19th century styles of architecture for which Kingdom is known. And because they are all located within less than a half mile, you might be inspired to take a walk sometime this spring along Kingdom's Main Street to admire them. So go ahead and take a screenshot if you'd like and use this as your guide. Now we're gonna step back in time to learn about the beginning of the Jacobs family in Hingham in the first half of the 17th century. Nicholas Jacob was among the first group of English settlers. He arrived in Hingham with his wife, Mary, and two children, John and Elizabeth in 1633. A couple of years later, after more English settlers had arrived here, an assignment of house lots was made first on Town Street, close to Hingham Harbor, which we know today as North Street. So in 1635, and this is from that assignment of properties, Nicholas Jacob is assigned a house lot on Town Street and other lands are assigned to him elsewhere in town for farming, uh, for uh, there's some salt marsh he gets, uh, some timber lots, very typical of the way the Puritans uh, assigned land to meet the needs of the, of the people in the town, the settlers. In 1637, the town authorized Nicholas Jacob along with three other men, Thomas Loring, Clement Bates, and Joseph Andrews to erect a structure known as a weir for trapping alewife at the mouth of the river that we now know as the Weir River for that reason. In 1640, Nicholas Jacob opened what was Hingham's first ordinary. Now, the ordinary was a kind of stopping place for travelers. Uh, they didn't necessarily get a place to sleep, but they got, a, got something to eat as they traveled on their way. And Nicholas Jacob ran an ordinary from his home on Town Street. Nicholas also served the community in other ways. He was a selectman, in, I'm sorry, I did go back. Um, he was a selectman in 1637 and later a deputy to the general court. So now we're gonna talk about Nicholas's son, John Jacob. So Nicholas, Nicholas's son who became known as Captain John Jacob uh, would have been a young child when they arrived in Hingham in 1633. He would later become a member of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company. Now this company was chartered in 1638 as a volunteer militia company charged with training officers in local militia units across Massachusetts. According to the 1893 History of Hingham, which is a terrific resource, by the way, and is available at libraries and online and at the Historical Society, uh, Captain John Jacob was, quote, an able and trusted officer in the war against King Philip. John Jacob's company, the history says, guarded the frontiers from Milton to the Plymouth Colony boundary with reportedly only small loss sustained. As some of you know, King Philip's war was the battle between the settlers and the Native Americans who were here. Well, John's oldest son, John Jacob Jr. was killed during King Philip's war at age 22. He was shot by Indians while hunting deer in a field near the family home. Now, some of you may have heard a story that connects John Jacob Jr.'s death with the naming of Glad Tidings Rock, a major feature uh, in the uh, Jacobs Meadow area. 
but this story is disputed in Solomon Lincoln's 1827 History of the Town of Hingham. So I will be happy to tell you that story during the Q&A, but I'm not sure it's true, so I'm not gonna tell you now. Well, this is how uh, the History of Hingham describes this portion of, Hing of South Hingham uh, through the uh, through the 17th and, and 18th centuries. The region about the meeting house at South Hingham was largely occupied at this time by the Jacobs, a wealthy and influential family. Foremost among them was Captain John Jacob. So Captain John Jacob lived on Main Street near the meeting house of Second Parish once that was built and we'll hear about that. And he was described as an active businessman. Captain John also carried on his father's example of public service to Hingham. He served as a selectman for five terms, not all of them consecutive, but certainly was considered a leader in the town. He also was quite a leader in his family because he had 15 children. Now this is by two wives, his first wife died, um, and he was described as among the moneyed men of the town with a sawmill, a fulling mill, and much land. Now, uh, I'm gonna mention an another son, John, because I told you that the son, the first son, John Jr. had been killed during King Philip's war. Well, Captain John and his second wife named their fourth son, John. And I'm mentioning him because he also became a very important figure in Hingham. This John Jacob Jr. had prominent roles in government as a selectman and as a representative of the town, uh, was a church deacon and had a farm of about 200 acres. It was very interesting to read that in 1749, his farm had 10 cows, six oxen, two horses, 38 sheep, and harvested 176 bushels of corn. And that year, he paid more in taxes than any other Kingdom resident. So obviously, the Jacobs family was doing well. And I've just lost my place, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Captain John Jacobs and his descendants play a large role in harnessing water power for mills in the 17th through the 19th century, both in Hingham and elsewhere on the South Shore. In 1693, when Captain John Jacob dies, he willed to his sons Peter and Samuel, quote, my sawmill and fulling mill with the ponds and land adjoining on both sides of the river, also two great lots. Well, Captain John Jacobs mills were located on the Crooked Meadow River, which connects to the body of water that we know today as Cushing Pond. And a fulling mill, for those of you who are not familiar with that, was used in the production of wool. After the wool is sheared from the sheep, spun into thread, woven into cloth, the cloth would then go to a fulling mill where it would be wet and pounded. And this tightens the weave and makes the cloth more durable. This is just a screenshot of, of the will of John Jacob. He bequeathed to his daughters, Mary, Sarah, JL, Elizabeth, Lydia, and Abigail, gifts of a variety of land, upland, meadow, river frontage, swamp land in Hingham, and, and 12 acres of land beyond Crooked Meadow Bridge, so in the neighborhood that we're talking about today, as well as a share in a corn mill in Weymouth. Well, this shows you where the Crook Meadow River crosses Main Street to Route 228. Um, and so it, this is on the Jacobs Meadow side up at the top, and then this goes down to where Cushing Pond is. Uh, the Jacobs family were directly connected with property in a couple of houses near where the river crosses Main Street, including 627 and 649 Main Street, these were homes uh, owned and occupied by the Jacobs family as late as 1890. There's some back land on this side of Main Street behind the Second Parish Church, which is now preserved as the Crooked Meadow River Conservation Area. Helen Burns, who for a time owned the property at 691 Main Street, had donated that parcel to the Hingham Conservation Commission. And now we're gonna talk about a Cushing family connection. Aside from the fact that the Cushings and the uh, Jacobs family often were united in marriage uh, through the years. So Captain John had left his sawmill and fulling mill to two of his sons, but they were later sold by son Peter 
after his brother Samuel had died, to Theophilus Cushing Jr. It seems that Peter continued for a time in at least an operational role at the flowing mill that Captain John had started along the river. Theophilus would add a grist mill at what became known as Cushing Pond, and the sawmill and grist mill there continued to be operated by the Cushing family until about 1850. In 1742, Theophilus Jr., who's now a well-to-do landowner and mill operator, would give the land on Main Street needed to establish a church for South Hingham, which is now known as Second Parish. Four years later, the congregation would hold its first meeting, led by the Reverend Daniel Shute. Well, Second Parish is right across the street from the Helen Burns home in the 20th century. We saw that earlier on that map of, of the historic district. Reverend Stephanie Shute Kelch, the minister to Second Parish today and a descendant of Reverend Daniel Shute, told me that Helen was a much loved member of the Second Parish congregation. And I think it is fitting here to give a happy anniversary shout out to the congregation of Second Parish, which this year is celebrating its 275th anniversary of that first meeting of the South Hingham congregation in 1746. So congratulations. Here is a wonderful word picture of what this part of South Hingham was like in the mid 18th century as that new church held its first services. I'm just gonna read this. Above on Glad Tidings Plain is the meeting house served by Dr. Shute's venerable father. The countryside around is worked by substantial farmers who have shorn the undulating hills and covered them with waving grain fields and flocks of quiet sheep. A beautiful picture of what life was like in South Hingham at that time. Well, there's a bit more to say about the history of water powered mills related to the Jacob and Cushing families in this part of Hingham. In 1720, Captain John Jacob's daughter, Mary Jacob, married Abel Cushing. And Mary and Abel's courtship, I think, had a lot to do with the mill. Two years earlier, Abel's father, Theophilus Cushing Sr., had died, and in his will, Theophilus bequeathed to his son Abel, quote, my fulling mill and mill pond, the land of mine that encompasses it, also part of the land that lies upon Hages Bridge Brook. And there was more given to his son, including a home there. 13 years earlier in 1705, Abel's father, Theophilus, had received town approval to dam the stream near Pages Bridge and he then built a fulling mill there. This is the fulling mill pond that many of you in Hingham are familiar with, located off South Pleasant Street, a street originally known as Pages Bridge Road. Now, before, the, he, that he, before he inherited that property and the mill, Abel Cushing had learned how to operate a fulling mill by apprenticing with Peter Jacob, who happened to be Mary's father. So perhaps that's what brought Abel and Mary together. It's a charming idea in any event. The fulling mill that Abel inherited would be expanded to include the dyeing of wool fabric, and it was operated through the early part of the 19th century by members of the Cushing family. It then became a factory for making shoe pegs until it was destroyed by a fire in 1845. The one footnote about Abel Cushing and his wife, Mary Jacob, their daughter, Mary Cushing, became the wife of the Reverend Daniel Shute. Mary sadly died young, likely due to complications from childbirth, just after their second child, a son named Daniel, was born. We've talked about the importance of, to the Jacobs family of their land in South Hingham for growing crops, grazing animals, and in particular, the harnessing of water flowing through the area for their mills. But I also want to mention the importance of woodland. Jotham Jacob, a grandson of Peter Jacob, who built the home at 648 Main Street, was a blacksmith and a farmer. And when he died in 1852, Joth Jotham's extensive land holdings included meadow and pasture land and cedar swamp, and also 10 acres of woodland at the Eel River. 
Well, today, just like with the conservation and parkland at Jacob's Meadow, and the land along the Crooked Meadow River, you also can enjoy walks in the woods at Eel River. And here is a scenic vista at another point in the Eel River woods. And to the right, you see the sign marking the entrance along Cushing Street. In this portion of a 2015 Town of Hingham trail map, you see the Eel River Conservation Area, a 12 acre woodland donated to the Hingham Land Conservation Trust by the late Mary Niles of Hingham, another wonderfully public spirited woman of Hingham. On this map, you also can see another parkland and conservation area near Cushing Pond called Mildred Cushing Woods, donated by the late Mildred Cushing to the town of Hingham. Well, as I began working on this program, I was asked by a fellow board member if Jacobs Meadow in Hingham had a connection with Jacobs Pond in Norwell. And the answer is absolutely yes. This is how that came about. In 1688, one of the sons of Captain John Jacob of Hingham, David Jacob, moved to Situate, where he purchased land from his maternal uncle, George Russell. David would later become the town's first schoolmaster. Later, David's son, Joshua, who had by then become a large owner, landowner himself, would establish Jacob's Mills in what is now Norwell, but originally had been South Situate. He did this with his brother, Dr. Joseph Jacob. To establish the mill operation, the third Herring Brook was dammed at Main Street, which many of us know as Route 123, in 1730. And that created Snappet Pond, which is now known as Jacob's Pond. And that's where a grist mill and a sawmill were established. For a time, they also made bricks there. Well, today in Norwell, as in Hingham, the Jacobs family legacy is represented by conservation land with hiking trails and protected wetlands. And nearby on Washington Street in Norwell is the historic home known as the Dr. Joseph Jacobs and Captain Enoch Collimore Homestead. Dr. Joseph Jacobs resided here until his death in 1780 when his estate was divided between his wife and his heirs. And his, he and his family are buried with marked grave sites at the Jacobs Collimore Cemetery nearby. Well, one of Dr. Joseph Jacobs' descendants brought this branch of the family back to South Hingham and made his own mark on the town. Dr. Joseph Jacobs' great-grandson, Joseph Jacobs IV, moved to South Hingham at age 16 to be an apprentice as a blacksmith, most likely for some of those blacksmiths in the Jacobs family. He married a distant cousin, Esther Cushing Jacobs, and they moved into the home at 649 Main Street that had been built in 1822 by Esther's brother, Laban Jacobs. They would live here for more than 60 years. In about 1836, using his expertise as a blacksmith, Joseph began the Jacobs Hammer Company from the rear of his home on Main Street. And Joseph then expanded to hatchets and other edge tools and shifted from handwork to horsepower first in 1837 and then to steam power in 1846. And in 1860, when his son Joseph became a partner, the firm, which was now known internationally for their products as the Jacobs Hatchet Company, had expanded at Wilder's Mill at Cushing Pond. So Wilder's Mill was also making a lot of woodenware, which Hingham was known for, uh, but they expanded their uh, edge tool company there at Cushing Pond. Relatives who worked at the factory included Joshua Jacobs, that blacksmith who owned the pasture land that we started this program with behind the home that Helen Burns bought in the 20th century. Uh, and one of Joshua's brothers worked there as well. In 1875, Joshua Jacobs Jr., so this is Joshua, uh, I mean, sorry, this is Joseph Jacobs V, and his brother Frederick carried on as Joseph Jacobs' sons after Joseph Sr. had retired. And in 1883, 
the business was sold to the Underhill Edge Tool Company of Nashville, New Hampshire, and Frederick Jacobs, who then ran the business, moved to New Hampshire with his family. Well, here you see from a family tree that I've now created on Ancestry as part of this project. You know, it's slightly blurry, uh, but this is just uh, a, the point I want to make is the is the line of Joseph Jacobs. So here's Dr. Joseph Jacobs back in situ, his son Joseph, his son Joseph, his son Joseph, his son Joseph. Uh, so uh, this is a, a love of continuing family names in the family. Well, I feel very fortunate that I came across this photo from sometime in the 1880s with representatives of four generations of the Jacobs family. And they happen to be in this Joseph Jacobs line. So that's why I'm showing it to you at this point in the program. So see here in the center in the front is Joseph Jacobs Sr. He's the one who founded the hammer company that became the edge tool company. And with Joseph is his wife, Esther to the left, and his daughter-in-law, Clarissa. And standing behind them is his son, Joseph, who for a while worked at the Edge Tool Company. But after leaving the company, Joseph Jr. became president of Kingham National Bank and also worked for some investment companies in Boston. And he is standing with his daughter, Fanny, and her husband, Henry Cushing, as well as their young son, Winthrop. Well, it's my theory, we don't have an exact date for this photograph, it's my theory that it may be from an 1888 celebration of the 60th wedding anniversary of Joseph and his wife, Esther. Uh, that, uh, that celebration at their home got a big write-up in the Hingham Journal at the time, and that would have been certainly a time for a formal family photograph. Well, now just quickly, I'm gonna show you Fanny Adams Jacobs line. And the reason I'm showing you this is that she is one of, of many marriages between a Cushing and a Jacobs. But also interesting to see is that within both the Jacobs family and the Cushing family, it is not at all unusual for distant cousins to marry each other. Um, and I think you can see that if you look back a couple of generations, you see Jacobs on both sides and Cushings on both sides. Um, so it's interesting to see that happening in Hingham. I'd seen a presentation earlier this year about uh, the Thomas Jefferson's family and how he urged his daughter to marry a distant cousin. And it was a way of keeping businesses and land in the family. Uh, so that may have been what motivated this family. Well, we could uh, talk for hours, I think, about the lasting imprint of the Jacobs family on Hingham and other parts of the South Shore, uh, like Norwell. But I'm hoping that the introduction I provided leaves you with some knowledge of the generations of Jacobs family members who worked the land, raised livestock, harvested timber, built mills and operated them, and made tools in the 18th and 19th centuries in and around Glad Tidings Plain. And as we celebrate this 30th anniversary of Jacob's Meadow, we are so thankful to the late great Helen Burns for her appreciation of the history, the beauty, and the environmental importance of the land behind her cottage that buckled and bumped, as we heard before, on Main Street, and for her gifts to the Land Trust and the town of Hingham. There is certainly much to think about the next time you take a walk at Jacob's Meadow. And I'm hoping you're ready for taking a virtual walk right now. There's much to observe on the walk as you are about to see. And for our first ever virtual walk, a spring walk at Jacobs Meadow, I will now turn the program over to fellow Land Trust Board member, Zach Mertz. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, Eileen, thank you so much. That was incredible. I am always floored at how big of an influence that family has had on Hingham um, and our landscape. Um, and so, yeah, tonight we have put together a short video. Um, we wish we could be out there in person with all of you. However, of, you know, given current circumstances, a virtual walk was a little safer, but I hope this gives you a slightly different perspective on the meadow if you visited before. And if you haven't visited yet, I hope it entices you to get out there and check it out. It truly is one of the most incredible places in Hingham and feel very honored to be part of an organization that helps protect it. 
Uh, so today's video is going to be um, with Steve Ivis. He's a local uh, wetland scientist, conservation conservation agent for a few towns. Um, and he's a really engaging speaker. It was all I could do to keep up with him out there. And also with fellow board member, Rick Rolliter. He's the property steward for this property. So today's video will both give you a little look into the flora and fauna of Jacob's Meadow, um, but also we'll hear from Rick a little bit about what being a property steward out there means. Um, and if there are any interested parties in the audience tonight, maybe how they can get involved and help us protect this resource. Um, so without further ado, I am going to share my screen and I will show you the video. 30 years of stewardship at Jacob's Meadow. Jacob's Meadow is a 50 acre parcel of land nestled in the heart of Hingham, Massachusetts. It hosts a wide variety of environments and habitats, including upland woodlands and deciduous forests, edge habitats, and of course, the large open meadow. This incredible property is open for exploration every day and can be accessed by parking behind the Wilder School right off of 228. Just remember, the park opens outside of school hours and closes at sunset. In today's video, we're gonna get an up-close look at the types of plants and animals that call Jacob's Meadow home. Steve Ivis, local conservation agent and biologist will be our guide and will take us through the different habitats and show us the types of things that are living in each section of the meadow. We're also gonna hear from Rick Rolander, HLCT board member, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the role of being a property steward at this amazing property and all of the hard work that goes into maintaining it. Let's check in with Rick to get started. Hello, my name's uh, Rick Rolletter, and I serve as a board member on the Board of Trustees for Hingham Land Conservation Trust. And I also have a special role with the board that I serve as the Jacobs Meadow property steward. Jacobs Meadow is approximately 50 acres of open fields and varied woodlands uh, right here in the center of uh, Hingham, Massachusetts. To help us get oriented, Rick is going to introduce us to the information kiosks found throughout the property. He'll also talk about some waypoints to help us find our way around the trails. So when you visit Jacobs Meadow, there are three information kiosks that are on the property and on the trail. And this particular map was developed by the Hingham Land Conservation Trust and also the Hingham Conservation Commission. And it has a legend to show you uh, the different types of trails, bodies of water, uh, the elevation. And as you look at this particular map, we're located right here at the beginning. And behind me is a large meadow. It's the most open space that we have here on the property. And the narrow trail is represented by these dotted lines. And the wider trails are marked by the lines that are complete, uh, not dotted. And there are two loops on the property, one to the north and one to the south. Today, we'll be following the south loop. Let's go check in with our trail guide. Good morning, folks. My name is Steve Ivis. Um, I am a wetland scientist. I have a private practice, and I also work for a couple of towns as their conservation agent in the area. And I'm a member of the uh, Land Conservation Trust. Today, we're here at Jacobs Meadow, uh, property we're celebrating 30 years uh, of, uh, with the, with the uh, Land Trust. And we're at the top of the hill here, We've come in the entrance from the school at 666 Main Street. Um, we've walked through the playground and up a hill, and we're at the top of the hill here, looking down into the meadow. And what I'm seeing here is first, a couple of really interesting things. I'm seeing some very large eastern white pine trees, one of which is broken down. Uh, it's a standing dead tree now, and it's called a snag, S-N-A-G. That's the term. And that will be giving back to the local uh, wildlife as habitat and 
and nutrients for the ground for the next 50 to 100 years. Secondly, we have a large, what I call wolf tree. It might have grown that in the, uh, in the open so that you can see the branches go out further than most of the other pines. Uh, most of the other pines had to compete with each other here. There's also some black cherry. That's this tree right here, good size black cherry. Uh, you'll see up in here, you'll see a burl. You're not sure how and why these things are, are caused. I call them undifferentiated tissue, or like a tree, I call them tree cancers because they grow sort of like a tree cancer. It may have some insect, uh, uh, insect, insect that's produced chemicals that creates that area. I am not sure. I think the jury is still out and still available for research. If anybody wants to do a master's or doctorate thesis, <laughs> we have also some young um, red cedar, eastern red cedar here. Another coniferous tree right here. One that grows very, very well on dry soils. You'll see that the ocean is a lot as well. Um, and it's a, it's a very strong wood. Uh, it was used for, and still is in some places, uh, shingles, Eastern Red Cedar shingles, wonderful long lasting shingles because of the tannic acid in, in the tree. Uh, we're looking at a cellar hole of something here perhaps. Uh, or a borrow pit, one of the two uh, on this hill. There's an exposed ledge there, and you can see lichen on the rock here. A couple of different species of lichen, a couple of different colors. A little symbiosis between algae and fungus. Now that we've learned a bit about the plants growing at the beginning of Jacob's Meadow, we're going to venture further into the property. But before we go, we want to show you two important landmarks along the way. We're here at the Jacobs Meadow uh, dedication rock. Uh, this is, I'm going to read it. Jacobs Meadow, a generous gift of Helen P. Burns, dedicated in 1991. Well, here we are in 2021, 30 years later. Isn't that great? Here I am at a, on a, uh, a bench. This one says, in happy memory of Willis M. Ertman, 1927 to 2018, the founding trustee Hingham Land Conservation Trust. So I'm getting, I'm going to get off the bench now. I've enjoyed this and walk down the, down through the meadow to the east. On this large wolf eastern white pine, I call it a wolf tree because it's growing out in the middle of something. We've got all these roots and vines. If you get real close to the vines, you can see that they have very small rootlets here. Uh, this is our friend, poison ivy. Uh, it, it's using the tree for a support. It's not gonna kill the tree. It's just using it for support. And it's very, very happy growing here. And not only that, we've got lichen right here growing on top of the poison ivy roots, the large roots. There's a number of species of lichen on this tree. Uh, they are very, very happy growing here. Just past the large eastern white pine, we've got an ancient high bush blueberry bush. I say ancient because the, uh, the stems are quite large and the bush looks like it has quite a bit of buds on it this year. It would be interesting to come back in, uh, in uh, early July to uh, have a few blueberries. Meadow to the east there, to the west on that side, toward the, toward the uh, Memorial Rock. And noting that the meadow is cut very, very well. So a plow has been in here, uh, I'm sorry, a tractor has been in here uh, cutting the meadow probably at least once or twice a year 
because it's easy to walk through and the grass is not very high. A lot goes into maintaining a meadow of this size. Let's check back in with Rick to learn a little more about the process. So behind me is the largest open space that we have here at the property. And down through the center of the meadow, we have a wide walking trail. And the donations and the contributions that you make to the Hingham Land Conservation Trust allow us to have the funding to be able to maintain this beautiful area. We have a professional landscaping service that comes in twice per year uh, in the fall and in the spring to be able to cut down the high grass, but we leave the walking trail open for visitors. Here in the middle of the meadow is a old cart path, uh, probably a farmer's pathway. And my guess is the meadow might have been farmed on both sides at one time. And this path was used as an access point through the meadow. Uh, and it was only used here. And that's why it's got a little depression here as well. There's a depression probably about six inches or so from the sides, uh, very easily seen and understood. Now that we've gotten our bearings and learned a little bit about the plants and uses at the beginning of Jacob's Meadow, let's take a short walk and we'll see some wetland features, a second meadow, and even an upland woodland. It's April 2nd, it's uh, in the 30s today, maybe early, maybe the low 40s, and we see some red maple blossoms. They're just coming out. Uh, we had some rain yesterday in the morning. Uh, today is opening day for the Red Sox, and we've got some great blossoms on the red maple here. If you could point that camera up to that area, you'll see that the ones that are higher up on the tree are further out, further, uh, yeah, further, further out in terms of the blossoms. People don't realize that red maples, in fact, trees have blossoms too. Red maples do well both in upland areas and in wetland areas. You'll see some red maples in the wetland in a little while. One of the most interesting things about this property is the numerous vernal pools that dot the landscape. We happen to be visiting on a very special night called Big Night. Let's check in with Steve to explain what that is. Big Night is the night, usually a rainy night in March or early April, where the salamanders and wood frogs congregate in vernal pools. Uh, these vernal pools are areas that are wet in the spring, uh, don't usually go and become wet through the through the summer months. Uh, in fact, most of the time they last about two months in vernal pools. And we're going to take a look at one right over here. If we look into the pool area itself, I see water striders on top of the water already. I think those are the first ones I've seen this year. And right there. We have a very interesting plant. I don't know how it does it, but it grows in the water. It's called common button bush. It's this plant here. It looks like a plant that needs some assistance, but no, it, that's exactly what it looks. That's exactly its habit, how it grows. Uh, it's growing right from inside the water and it's, uh, it's just doing fine. Further over in that little cove over there to our west and another little area, I see what we call tussock sedges. Tussock, tussock sedge, also called uptight sedge, Carex stricta, one of my favorite plants. At this point, we turned around and started heading for the South Loop Trailhead. We saw a few extra plants along the way. This vine right here and here Luckily, this one this one's down already. 
uh, many, many smaller vines here. These are all Asian bittersweet. It's an invasive plant that will, will indeed take trees down. Uh, it, it wraps itself around the tree bark and uh, actually will sometimes kill a tree that way as well. Uh, they are also very heavy. They, I've seen them take trees down. At the same location, at the base of this, this Asian bittersweet, we have one of the first flowering plants that we'll see in the, in the spring. Sadly, another invasive, this is garlic mustard. Uh, this is the rosette, it's a biennial. So this rosette has probably just come up a little higher than it used to be right on the ground. And now it's, it's coming up and when, when the ground gets a little bit warmer, it'll pop up and have flowers all within a week, about a week from now. Notice from the change in environment, we've now entered the wetlands portion of Jacob's Meadow. These low-lying habitats benefit from a lot of water and some are fed by small tributaries, such as Falling Mill Brook. Here's an interesting tree. It's called ironwood. It's called musclewood or blue beech. Uh, if you look at the trunk very carefully, it looks muscles, uh, people's muscles. Uh, these are pretty, pretty good sized uh, blue beach here. In fact, some of the biggest ones I've ever seen. They're very happy growing. So we're looking at a little brook here. This to me looks like a little intermittent stream that's coming off the lane of property. And we're down right along the brook. It's only three feet wide. It's got a beautiful gravel and sandy substrate. Uh, we're right next to some plants that are going to pop their beautiful little yellow blossoms probably next week. These are called Northern Spice Bush, Lindera, and Zoan. Uh, we've got lots of skunk cabbage growing in the bank here of the brook. Beautifully, almost look like irises there, don't they? But no, there's skunk cabbage. <laughs> So at this point, Steve and I got off the trail and did some backwoods exploring. But to help orient you to where you are on the loops, we're gonna check back in with Rick, who's gonna show us the remaining two kiosks and Glad Tidings Rock. So as I mentioned earlier, there are three kiosks on the property and we're at the second kiosk. And we started from behind the Wilder Memorial School. We walked through the main meadow dotted line is and then we came down to this section of the meadow and then took a right up this particular trail and now we're at the intersection of that trail and the south loop and if you head up the trail just a little bit further so we're on the south loop and we're at the third kiosk and just to my right is glad tidings rock and then the south loop continues to my left further down if I was to go straight ahead, that leads to uh, the laner property. So Steve and I made it back to the loop path and we're gonna take it up to the highest elevation on the South Loop Trail. This will lead you all the way back to the entrance of the meadow where you can exit through the Wilder School. Beautiful, beautiful valley. Uh, eskers on both sides, uh, lots of east and white pines and some small east and white pines, of course, that have grown up where other pines have fallen. This land has been left alone for many years and it's absolutely a magnificent location in the world. It's a beautiful spot, but maintaining a pine forest does come with some challenges. So on the trail, after fierce storms and heavy winds, many times we find fallen trees that cross the trail and here's a good example so myself and others on the board and those that wish to volunteer can come out and bring their train saws their axes and help us to be able to clear trees and other fallen debris that cross the trail if you'd like to help us out with trail maintenance or find out about other volunteer opportunities visit our website on the way out, we thought we'd leave you with one more plant 
the first flowering plant we've seen on our walk today, just at the beginning of spring. Uh, Vinca minor, of course, also called myrtle. If I could spend all day just hanging out here, I would. Thank you for uh, joining us on this on this little escapade in uh, Jacobs Meadow. I hope you take the time to come here and enjoy it. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope this video has inspired you to come out and explore this property. To learn more about the Hingham Land Conservation Trust, our other properties, and the work we do, visit hinghamlandtrust.org. Thank you. So if any of you would like to ask questions of Zach or myself, um, or any questions about the Hingham Land Conservation Trust, um, and Art's gonna join us as well. Uh, so uh, hope you enjoyed our first ever virtual tour. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, you know, we mentioned that this is an all volunteer board. We had never asked anyone on the board to take on something like this before. and. Uh, Zach was up to it, and we so appreciate his talents in, in pulling this together. Uh, you know, he, he works full time, so this is uh, uh, out of his personal time that he squeezed time to, to do this, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you both. <clears throat> it was great, and um, just check in right now. We don't, we don't have any questions right now, but we um, can give people a couple minutes to see if they have anything. Going to shoot at us. I've seen some thank yous coming in from the chat. So, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, nice group. Uh, you know, evenings are busy times to have a presentation, and, and I really appreciate your attending. Okay, we we do have one question actually. Ah. It's about Jacobs Meadow. So this is from Susan, asking if anyone's ever done a butterfly survey there. I don't know if you had heard anything about that, Zach, or if Steve had mentioned it. Uh, no, he mentioned he had done um, some entomology there, and uh, I think he was doing macroinvertebrate studies. But I did not hear anything about butterflies yet. But that would be a that would be a very cool thing to do. As as he did mention, there were some pollinator plants um, in the wetland portion. Another. It's mentioned because the as you he pointed out the button would plant, which was, which is a, a great plant for um, nectar for pollinators. Another question, uh, uh, Deidre Anderson is asking that when she was out walking in Jacob's Meadow with her family, she saw some people using metal detectors and wondered if there was something specific they might be looking for. Um, I don't know if, you now obviously this was farmland uh, near a mill, uh, you know, you might pick up pieces of metal that, you know, historically, uh, had been part of those operations. Uh, otherwise, you know, people walk in the park and sometimes people with metal detectors are looking for just, you know, spare change uh, that uh, people might have uh, left along the way. Uh, so I'm not aware of anything specific that anyone would be looking for there. Right. I, I, I should I, mention because of the, the questions about the butterfly survey, that we're hoping within the next couple of years uh, to start some research grants. Um, you'll hear more about that next year, which is a big anniversary year for the Land Trust. We'll be 50 years old next year. And so one of our initiatives next year um, is to uh, start a research grant program with, some, uh, with a bequest that we've received, uh, which you'll hear more about um, in the months to come. So. Um, that might be something that we we do uh, to do that kind of a study of butterflies or other insects for that matter. And I was just going to mention, I did not realize that um, until Steve pointed it out, the amount of the bittersweet that we have growing in there. And that's something we could consider doing is working on eradication at some point. Yeah. Yeah, and that uh, Asian vine that can take trees down, I was also thinking the same thing. That might be something that we can get out there with some volunteers and see if we can you know, get some of that vine down. Um, so question uh, from someone I know, 
is is there access to Jacobs Meadow from the yards of the homes along Main Street? And yes, the, the private homes there in some cases do have access. Um, I know that there was a former board president who lived in what had been Helen Burns' home, and he, and he talked about having wonderful walks at Jacobs Meadow. Uh, so I suspect that that some of the private homes there that you know border the meadow uh, walk from their backyard. Yeah. I'll say too, we, we didn't get to include everything in the video, you know, with the limited amount of time, but, but Steve took me on a jaunt straight through the woods and part of the laner property. Um, and when you walk the two together, it's, it's just incredible. The diversity of habitats you see, diversity of animals. It's, it's, uh, it's really an awesome way to spend an afternoon. Right. And, and you pointed out the, you know, the, the water areas and, uh, you know, it's such an important part of town for our Weir River watershed. Uh, to, because so these are all feeder streams that are important uh, for the wells that we get our water from. And Fulling Mill Pond, the area around there is all water company uh, property because they have wells there. Uh, so uh, question about, is there an entrance on the laner property? Yes, um, you can, uh, if you enter the laner property, you can continue into Jacob's Meadow. Um, and so um, if you, I think if you look at the maps, you might be able to figure out how to do that. Uh, we have sometimes taken people on, on walking tours to get them from, from one place to another, but there is a connect, direct connection from the Lena property into the Jacobs Meadow property and vice versa. You can walk from one to the other. Uh, let's see. There was another question. Uh, oh, about Helen, about Helen Burns. And uh, so Helen acquired this property. Um, it, she didn't own it initially. It was not part of her home um, or her home purchase. Um, she was just someone who was really motivated to conserve land. Um, and so I didn't know Helen. She, she died before I moved to, to Hingham. Uh, there may be others on, on the, the call today who, who remember Helen. Uh, but uh, she, she just made it her business to acquire this land to conserve it. And uh, she acquired it gradually over, I think about a 30 year period. Uh, so, so there were three parcels that she gave to the land trust at different times. It was only after we had all three parcels and then got some smaller parcels that enabled us to give access to the public that we opened Jacob's Meadow. But earlier she'd given some property to the Hingham Conservation Commission and there was some other conservation land already in the area. So altogether that made the 50 acres of Jacob's Meadow, uh, but she was just a determined woman. Uh, question about are there plans for any guided walks for the upcoming season? We are hopeful that we can do a guided walk in the fall, uh, but this virtual walk is our spring walk, uh, sadly, uh, because uh, it just wasn't a time where we could uh, get a group of people together uh, and, you know, when we do walks, you're kind of tight together so that you can hear uh, our guides speak. And we didn't want to take any chances. So uh, we're hopeful that the fall will be um, a good opportunity for us to do walks in person again. Okay. <laughs> Someone has asked me to talk about the competing stories about the reason that The Rock got the name Glad Tidings. So there are at least three stories that I have heard, but I'm going to give you the story that actually got the, the stories that got written up in a Hingham House Tour book years ago. So this is what, it, this is what the story is. The, there are two stories about how it received its name. Actually, they, they tell a third story as well. The simplest one is that a woman who became lost was discovered by her friends from the top of the rock. The other story vouched for by his descendants, but as I said in the presentation, Solomon Lincoln said it was not true, um, was that John Jacobs Jr., uh, John Jacob Jr. had declared many times that if he ever encounter encountered Indians, he would never allow himself to be taken alive and tortured. He feared that the Indians would torture him. And during King Philip's War, he went out to hunt deer in South Hingham near his home. And he was ambushed and killed by Indians near the rock. And when his friends found his body, the glad tidings went out that he had been killed outright and not tortured to death. So 
We believe this is a legend that has no basis in fact. We can't you know, talk to people who were alive at the time to determine. But in the, uh, in the book, 200 Years in South Hingham, Donald Robinson suggests yet another story. He says it was named uh, a place of glad tidings because thanks to the Native Americans who had lived here, it was in the earliest days used as an open fertile area for planting. So when the, settles, uh, when the settlers from England came here, they didn't have to clear the land because it had already been cleared for them by the Native Americans. Uh, they didn't have to cut down this big forest area. And so there were glad tidings that they had found this area where they could quickly put crops in the ground. Uh, so that was his theory. Um, and so those are the three stories that I have heard um, and there may be others. Okay, one, one more question is, do you know anything about the Helen Burns? So, so um, Dot Gell asked if she was one of the Burns sisters who lived on Emerald Street. I know that, that Helen moved to Hingham after having grown up in Pennsylvania, and she moved here in, the, in like 1939. Uh, so I, I'm guessing that you're talking about a family who uh, had maybe lived here for a generation or two. I, I really don't know uh, the details of Helen's life before she bought that cottage on Main Street. I think we've gotten to the end of the questions that I see. Okay. See anything else? I think, I think that is it. Um, how great that you uh, stayed with us this evening to ask some questions, a nice variety. Art, you wanna bring the meeting to a close? Yeah, yeah, no. So thank you, everyone, for um, joining us. And and as we said, we will be posting the the video um, on the website and making it available through Facebook as soon as it's um, available. And uh, and uh, just remember our website, uh, HinghamLandTrust.org, if you want to find out any further information or are interested in in getting involved. I should also mention that Harbor Media, they're gonna do a little bit of editing of this for us um, and they expect to uh, run it on their Hingham community cable channels. And also they're gonna share it with the Norwell community cable station. So it will be available in the months to come, uh, probably not, the, not too distant future. Okay, so with that, I will uh, bring the, the program to an end.